Um, great. And uh, while I'm screen sharing, um, I might not be able to see your faces or if you're raising your hands like this, I might not know. So if you do have a comment, just feel free to unmute and speak and we can kind of go from there. All right, any, any other technical questions or concerns? Great. Thank you all for being here, for signing up and being a part of this first event with me for JAST, uh, Reading Between the Lines 2022. This is really exciting for me. I want to thank the Japan America Society of Tennessee for hosting this event, for allowing me to run it. <laughs> a couple months ago, I reached out and said, hey, uh, you know, I'm already reading all of these Japanese books anyway, and I'd love to just meet other people to talk about them with. And JAST seemed like a really great community to do that. And so I'm so appreciative of you all giving me the space. And um, since we're doing it on Zoom, it opens it up to not just people in Tennessee, but beyond that. And I, I'm just really, really happy that this is happening. Um, let's see, before we get started, uh, just a really, really quick intro of who I am. I know some of you know me, but others don't. So my name is Yurina Yoshikawa. I'm a writer and writing instructor based in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I've lived here since about 2017. And before that, I was in New York for about 10 years. Uh, and before that, I kind of moved back and forth between Tokyo and parts of California, um, including Palo Alto, <laughs> where one of my friends here is from. Um, and so I kind of grew up uh, straddled between these two cultures and you know I'm bilingual but I'm actually a lot more comfortable in English and I think in English and I write in English but then I, um, I'm always gravitating towards Japanese literature or I'm gravitating towards writing about Japan where I'm originally from and um, so when I do read these Japanese books that we're going to be discussing in this, this series I tend to read the English translations um, at least for the first time. Sometimes I'll challenge myself and read the Japanese original later, but um, it does come with a challenge because I just didn't get a lot of that schooling in my background. Um, but I know that there might be some of you in this room who are professors um, or who teach at uh, Japanese literature. So I'm really curious to kind of hear your take on how you read Japanese literature um, when you do. Uh, let's see, what else can I say? Oh, and when I teach writing um, here in Nashville, it's through a wonderful organization called The Porch. And um, if you are ever interested in doing some creative writing, like writing a memoir or poetry or fiction, I really recommend that you check out The Porch. Uh, they also offer Zoom classes, so it doesn't really matter where you live. Um, and we also do a lot of literary events. And um, this month, we've actually invited Kiese Lehman to do uh, an event with us. And so, um, you know, it's a play, it's a really great literary hub based in Nashville. And um, yeah, that's kind of where I've been working. And this year, I'm trying to do a little bit more with my communities, you know, and so this is kind of one of my things, the book club with Jast. Oh, all right, enough about me. Let's talk about the book. How do you live by Genzaburo Yoshino? So uh, before I start screen sharing, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to listen to me talk for just a little bit longer. I'm gonna give a brief overview of the book and the author, just enough for all of you to kind of get a feel for what's going on and why this book is, um, why, why, why we chose this book and why it might be interesting to you. So in Japanese, the title is Kimi tachi wa dou ikiru ka? And it has been translated as How Do You Live? This book, it's a very um, unique, uniquely structured book. It uh, pivots between letters written from an uncle, between an uncle and a 15-year-old boy, and then an omniscient third perspective narrator who's sort of able to tell the readers what's going on in the lives of uh, these, these boys and in this particular world. So this book, was published originally in 1937. It's one of the Nihon Shosan Bunko, 
And this is a serial publication that was intended to transfer progressive ideas to school children in Japan. In other words, there were these publications that were meant to teach ethics via storytelling. Um, however, in 1925, Japan passed the public security preservation law, which made it a crime for anyone to say or write things that were critical of the government. So there, at one point in time, there was something called the toppo or thought police. And actually this author, Genzaburo Yoshino, before writing this book, he had been arrested for attending a political meeting. He was kind of a, you know, um, he, was an, he was an activist youth. And when he got out of prison, you know, and he was sort of scrambling to get a job and figure out what to do with his life, it was his friend um, who offered him a job to edit these ethics books. And it was his friend who had actually started um, working on this book, but then the friend fell ill and Genzaburo Yoshino ended up taking it on and finishing it and polishing it. And so it's his name on this book, even though it was his friend who started it. And um, the book was first published in 1937. So you can kind of imagine like really leading up to a lot of tumultuous events in the world. Um, and, you know, this book really is filled with so many global ideas. Um, it references things about French history. It talks about uh, the origins of Buddhism and in India and ancient Greeks. And it was like, uh, very, it was a really um, progressive book for its time. And um, actually during the war, the, the thought police did, um, they did censor this book um, because they thought it was a little bit too progressive. And it came back into print in 1945 with some of the parts still redacted. And, um, but there were so many uh, ardent readers of this book that uh, there was a movement to try to get the original, you know, back into print. And so it wasn't until the 50s that uh, the version that, you know, what the original version really came back. And ever since then, this book has been beloved by generations of Japanese people. And um, the reason why it's really in, you know, Japan's kind of uh, literary boom right now is because a few years ago, uh, the filmmaker Hayao Miyazaki, uh, who you might know as the filmmaker behind My Neighbor Totoro and Ponyo and, you know, a lot of great children's movies, um, he's adapting this book for his next feature film. And it's rumored to come out in the next couple of years. So I'm really excited about that. Um, if you know anything about Miyazaki's films, you know it's just going to be extraordinary and beautiful and, um, you know, it's going to be a good one. So, yeah, I think it'll be good to read this book before that movie comes out. And in Japan, after the news of Miyazaki's film announcement came out, um, a manga graphic novel version of this book also came out in 2017. So if you're more of a visual reader, I suggest looking into that. Um, just since, you know, there's a lot of different ways to read now. And um, let's see, what else is there to say about this? So, um, let's see. Oh, <laughs> one other interesting comparison. So there was a New Yorker article that likened this book to The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. And the reason is because just like this book, you know, this is a very short, book that was intended for um, children, right? And it's beautifully illustrated, but it's jam packed with philosophy and with a lot of politics and a lot of ideas that actually adults come away thinking about. Um, so in that sense, how do you live is sort of like a great Japanese sort of version of that. Um, it's in, It was intended for children um, and young readers, but really I think it's something that adults can carry with them and um, really think hard about. Um, this new version here uh, with this beautiful cover that came out last year, it was translated by Bruno Navaski, who um, traditionally translates poetry, but I think this is his first attempt at um, translating an entire book, and I think he did a beautiful job with it, uh, with a foreword by Neil Gaiman. So if you're a fan of fantasy books and you know Neil Gaiman, just know that he wrote a foreword to this and he uh, concludes, I am wiser for having read this book. And so uh, there you go, you know, um, a lot of reasons to read this. 
So let's see. Um, before we get into the actual excerpts, uh, here's what you need to know about this book. Um, it centers around a 15-year-old boy. His Japanese name is Junichi Honda, but throughout this book, uh, he is referred to by his nickname, which is Copper. And Copper is um, also a nickname. Um, the uncle uh, thinks that this boy, that his nephew, has such an inquisitive mind like Nicholas Copernicus that um, that's why he nicknames him Copper, just because Copernicus is kind of a mouthful. So um, in Japanese, it's Koperu. And in some translations in the past, it has been um, uh, spelled out like that with a K, K-O-P-E-R-U. But in this new translation, it's copper. And I think that's just much easier to read and follow. Um, the book includes musings on science, friendship, bravery, history, politics. This uplifting story, um, let's see. Oh yeah, you, I already said that. Um, so th the premise of this book is that copper, 15 years old, his father has passed away. And before he passed, he asked his brother, who's referred to as an unnamed uncle, he asked him to look after him and make sure that Copper grows up knowing how to be a great man. And like that is a big ask. So the uncle is, you know, burdened with this uh, brother's last wish. And so we enter this world where the uncle and, the, and his nephew are really, really close and they um, have a lot of conversations. And so it's not unusual for them in this family to talk a lot or to write letters to each other a lot. That's just kind of the relationship they, they have because of that. Um, if you know that movie from, <laughs> from the 90s called Stand By Me, um, this book also is similar in that it features four, uh, four teenage friends. So um, outside of Copper, I guess you can kind of see the four friends here. Outside of Copper, there's Kitami. He's another short boy like Copper, so that's why they get along. There's Mizutani, who comes from a wealthy family, lives in a big mansion. And then the fourth one, Uragawa, he comes from a working class and his family makes tofu. Um, and so you get that contrast with these four friends of all of these different kinds of backgrounds and you get a glimpse into life in Tokyo in the 1930s. Um, actually, one of my favorite chapters is where Uragawa describes, uh, or actually the narrator is describing how Uragawa is making tofu. If you don't know how tofu is made and how complicated it is, just read this book <laughs> and you'll just come away knowing exactly how that's done. Um, and the boys band together against a couple of older bullies. So that's another parallel with Stand By Me. All right, um, before we kind of dive into some excerpts, does anybody have any questions? or um, any points uh, you know, from whatever I said that confused you or anything I need to reiterate. And at any point, if you just wanted to unmute and say, hey, I have a question, please go ahead and do that. But I guess I'll start sharing my screen and start um, reading out some excerpts here. Um, let's see, all right. So I scanned these pages, how do you live? We're going to kind of skip around, but I'm going to try to, um, you know, describe for you kind of where we are in the book and why it's important. What I want to do is start from um, this first section. It's from chapter one in this book. And I wanted to start from, which page was it? I think it was this one, page 10. Okay. So what's going on here? The copper and his uncle are on the rooftop of a department store in the Ginza district of Tokyo. And this is pretty incredible because if you've ever been to Tokyo and if you've ever been to Ginza um, in recent times, these descriptions from the 30s actually um, resonates. Uh, it, it sounds really similar. The kind of hustle and bustle of the people, the cars looking like little toys, and Copper for the first time is kind of having this like um, very mature observation about the world just from looking at the people and the cars from the rooftop of a department store. Um, and I wanted to start here. Above the two of them, so this is at the bottom of page 10. 
Above the two of them in their conversation, the misty rain continued to fall. Copper and his uncle stood a while in silence, gazing at the city of Tokyo laid out below them. Beyond the falling rain, shimmering and trembling, the darkened city streets continued to run off to places unknown, where not a single human figure could be seen. Yet below them, without a shadow of a doubt, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people, were thinking their own thoughts, doing their own things, and living their lives. Yes, and those people, every morning, every evening, were rising and falling like the tides. Copper felt as if he were drifting into a big whirlpool. Hey, uncle? Yes? People are... Starting to speak, Copper turned a bit red, but he pulled himself together and spoke. People are... Well, they seem a little like water molecules, don't you think so? Indeed. If you are comparing human society to oceans and rivers, individual human beings could certainly be considered to be their molecules. And uncle, you're a molecule too, aren't you? That's right, and you are too, an extra small molecule, in fact. Don't make fun of me, molecules are automatically small, aren't they? Uncle, you're too long and thin to be a molecule. While he was speaking, Copper looked down at the Ginza Boulevard just beneath them. Cars, cars, cars. Come to think of it, inside each one of those rhinoceros beetle cars. So earlier he's looking at the cars and he compares the cars to rhinoceros beetles. Um, that's why this is kind of a funny phrase. Uh, rhinoceros beetle cars, there was of course a human being inside them. By chance, Copper's gaze settled on a single bicycle running along in the stream of automobiles. So this passage as I'm reading it, I just want you to imagine like, if you know Miyazaki's films, just imagine how he might put this into kind of like a visual, like one of those beautiful watercolor scenes. I just, I, as I read this, I just knew like, oh my gosh, I know why Miyazaki is doing this because it's just so, you can kind of see it happen in your mind. Um, the man riding it was clearly still quite young. His billowing raincoat was wet and shiny. The young man was looking to the sides, looking back, noting with care a car that had passed him, the whole time pedaling with all his might. He sped along the asphalt road, so slippery with rain, avoiding the cars to the left and right, all the while not dreaming that Copper was just looking down at him from this high up. Just then, a gray car appeared out of nowhere, overtaking two or three cars in front of it. Look out! Up on the rooftop, Copper shouted in his heart. Any moment, he thought, the bicycle will be sent flying. Yet the young man below him swerved nimbly and let the car pass him by. Then in an instant, he had barely righted the tilting bicycle before he was off again pedaling with all his might. The intense effort set his whole body in motion as he bore down on the pedals one leg after the other. Was he a messenger from somewhere, running off on some errand? Of course, Copper couldn't know. Here he was observing this unseen, unknowing young man from afar, and the object of his observation was totally unaware. To Copper, it was somehow a strange feeling. The place where the young man was riding was a spot that Copper and his uncle had driven past earlier that day when they came to the Ginza. Uncle, when we drove by down there, Copper said, pointing below, someone could have been watching from this rooftop. Yes, that's true. That is, we can't know for sure. In fact, there could be someone right now, perhaps, watching the two of us from a window somewhere. Copper looked around at the nearby buildings. Which building? Which building? There were so many windows. At his uncle's words, all the windows seemed to face in Copper's direction as he looked. But the windows just reflected the hazy brightness outdoors, each and every one, and shone like mica. Whether people were inside and could still see them, he couldn't know. Still, Copper couldn't help feeling that somewhere unbeknownst to him, there were eyes watching him steadily. He even had the distinct impression that he could see his own figure reflected in those eyes on a seven-story building in this hazy gray distance, a small, small figure standing on a rooftop. Copper had an odd feeling, the watching self, the self being watched, and furthermore, the self becoming conscious of all this, the self observing itself by itself from afar, all those various selves overlapped in his heart and suddenly he began to feel dizzy. In Copper's chest, something like a wave began to pitch and roll. No, it felt as if Copper himself were pitching and rolling. Then, in the city spreading boundless before him, the invisible tide welled up to the highest point. Before he knew it, Copper had become just another droplet inside that tide. Staring blankly, Copper was silent for a long time. After a while, his uncle spoke. Are you all right? Copper made a face like someone waking from a dream. And then seeing his uncle's face, he gave an awkward laugh. So that's uh, the end of one of the first sections. Um, I just kind of want to open it up to the room. Did anybody have any sort of like visceral reactions while um, reading this first passage? Any, any observations or thoughts or questions?
It reminds me of learning about watching the watcher with meditation. How, huh. uh, when I started my practice years ago, uh, I was having trouble. And one of the first things my teacher had me do was watch the person who's watching me. And it felt kind of like this. It was sort of a dizzying feeling because I felt disconnected, but connected at the same time, if that makes sense at all. Yes, that makes total sense. And also, I love that you're, um, that it reminded you of meditation. Um, and, and did you say that it helped? Oh, definitely. After I got over being terrified. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's so cool. Um, any other observations or questions? Irina, I was just reminded um, in reading this, of course, I grew up in a very small town in Tennessee, in Smyrna. And I remember as a, a young person, um, probably younger than Copper, uh, you know, looking out the window of my house and realizing that I was not the center of the universe, that there were um, all kinds of people in the other houses, you know, going about their day, doing things that really had no relationship to me. And that's really how I associated with this. I mean, what a revelation, right? Mm -hmm. um, from being really the center of your own universe and thinking that everyone is really just connected to you in some way. And that's their, their reason for being to all of a sudden realizing you are just a, you know, a drop in the tide, so to speak. So I, I, I really thought that was a, you know, a powerful beginning. Yes, um, thank you so much for sharing that, Lee. And I think um, the, the word droplet that you just said actually comes back. Um, he, he ends up describing, um, he and his uncle can kind of like over time continue this conversation and they keep talking about themselves as droplets and tides and waves. And um, yes, I feel like this is um, a really important part to notice. Um, I'm just going to scroll down to show you which page we're in around page 14. So we're still at the beginning. And this really sets the tone for the rest of the book. This is kind of the beginning of Copper realizing um, that there's this larger world outside of just him. And um, his uncle, who's right there with him in that moment, um, he, he notices uh, Copper sort of transforming in this moment. And so this prompts him to... Um, to start writing one of his longer letters. And that's the beginning of the next uh, part here that you can kind of see on my screen uh, where he's, you know, um, this is a little bit later actually, but uh, this is kind of the tone that, you know, his uncle always takes in these letters where he says, thank you so much for sharing this story. I could see you were excited. Um, I found the story deeply interesting. Like he's just so, the uncle is such a great model for uh, someone who's really empathetic and someone who's really, trying hard to mentor this young man. And um, these letters are, are some of my favorite parts. Um, let's see. I'm looking at the chat here. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's creepy, <laughs> by the way, Peyton. Um, I love that we're all having similar kind of um, experiences here, yes. Um, oh, I see, I see. Yeah, no, no worries. I, yeah, completely understand. Um, and the next excerpt that I wanted to share with you actually is in one of these letters that the uncle writes, and it's a little bit further down, I want to say. Um, yes, page 46. So we're going to skip forward a little bit. And um, the part that I wanted to share was the uncle in response to Copper's many questions and observations that he's had so far, the uncle um, clarifies something pretty, pretty pivot, you know, um, pretty significant for Copper. And it's here um, from this asterisk for it. I'll just read a little bit and then we can kind of talk about that. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, actually I'm gonna start a little bit further up. At times in your life, you have already come to think in earnest about the world and people's lives. So I will speak to you seriously about such matters without even half joking, because when it comes to things like this, you can't become a great man without having great thoughts. Even so, there's no point in telling you the world is like this, people's lives are like that. There's no way anyone can explain such a thing in a word or two to you. 
And even if there were, it's not the sort of thing where you could just listen and take it all in and say right away, okay, now I get it. When it comes to English, geometry, algebra, even someone like me could teach you these. However, people come together and build this world and they live their lives, different lives in it individually. And I cannot teach you what that means or what value it all has. That is something you must discover on your own as you get older. And even after that, when you are grown, you will have to study this and seek out the answers for yourself. You know that water comes from oxygen and hydrogen, don't you? And you're aware that in water, these are in a ratio of one part to two. This sort of thing can be fully explained in words. And what's more, you can watch an experiment in class and say to yourself, aha, I see how it works. But when it comes to the taste of cold water, there's no way to teach that other than letting you drink the water yourself. No matter how anyone tries to explain, you're not going to understand the actual taste unless you have that experience. In the same way, there's no way to explain the color red to anyone who hasn't seen it with their own living eyes, because it's something a person starts to understand only when the color red meets their eyes in reality. There are lots of things like this in life. So he kind of goes on and on, but this is a really crucial idea, I think, for the uncle to be telling Copper um, around this time, especially in the book, um, because, sorry, I'm just going to stop sharing for a second to talk a little bit. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a summary of what goes on, um, Copper, you know, he's a 15 year old kid. He's in a school with a bunch of boys and there are bullies. And so that's kind of his day-to-day -day conflict. And he and his friends um, up to this point have just kind of been victims of these bullies and they've let it happen and the adults look the other way. And it's through these conversations that Copper has with his uncle um, that he starts to gain a little bit more knowledge about what it means to be, what it means to be good or what it means to take action or what it means to, um, you know, what it means to be a good friend, things like that. And here when the uncle is saying like, you have to experience some things to really know it. I can't tell you. Um, that's where the book gets interesting because it, you know, as we saw the previous section that we looked at was in third person omniscient, sort of telling us what's happening. And then it's the, the novel, this whole book is kind of going back and forth between that and the uncle's letters where the uncle, I think he's a little bit hypocritical here because he is doing a lot of telling. <laughs> he is saying, Copper, here's what, here's how life is, here's how people, how, how people are, and here's what you need to know. But then again, in this one letter, he kind of says straight out, there are some things that you just need to experience, I can't tell you. And so that becomes the start for the book, at least. Um, when we go back to the kind of omniscient third, it starts to show us what's going on in Copper's life and what's going on with these bullies and, um, what what leads to one of the climactic parts of the book where the friends gather to to do something about it and to really stand up for themselves and um what that even looks like so um before i, I go to the next portion does anybody have any thoughts or questions about the format of the book or the letter writing aspect of it or anything from the previous section that you didn't get a chance to talk about I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Is there anything that you've gone over so far that would have been seen as, uh, I guess, scary for, I'm, I'm only assuming proletariat in Japan in, in the time that it came out. Was there anything that we've covered so far that was uh, a no-no? <laughs> That's a really great question. And I actually don't know uh, which parts exactly were redacted. Um, I assume, though, having read the whole book, that maybe some of the more, I guess, quote unquote, problematic parts um, would come a little bit later. And um, it's, um, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to that, actually, when we look at okay. one, one other section, because that's a really great one. But I think so far, I, I have a feeling, um, and this is why, like, the opening of books are so important, right? And I'm sure that the writer and his friend, um, the editor at the book, they kind of knew how to get under the radar of the thought police. And you know, the reason why they wanted to tell ethics um, through storytelling is to kind of um, is to kind of be sneaky about it and to try to 
uh, get through to these children without necessarily the authorities sort of like getting in the way and saying, no, you can't say that to them. Um, because with, with novels or storytelling, it's just a lot harder to pinpoint exactly what, you know, um, where that moment might be. So I think in the opening, they probably thought about that and try to make it as kind of like seamlessly, <laughs> um, just earnestly, like, you know, non-controversial maybe, yeah. But it does get more and more, um, I think it gets more and more interesting and global, but I have a feeling maybe some of those ideas were the ones that were redacted, like references to Napoleon or references to um, just, yeah, like like other other ideas from from other countries that maybe they were gonna fight with, you know. So, yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Cool. Let's keep moving forward. I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, let's see. The next part that I want to share, especially because of this audience with Jast, um, I really wanted to. I'm going to skip forward a little bit to this part. It's a beautiful part. It's also from one of the uncle's letters. And it's on page, for the people who have the book, it's on page 124. There it is. Okay. Now, um, this is kind of a short excerpt, but um, I'll read it out loud and then we can kind of talk about it, especially for those who are kind of familiar with Japanese culture and language. This is going to be, I think, an interesting excerpt. So I'm going to um, start from around the bottom of page 124. For now, what I want you to understand clearly is what a gift it is in a society like this to be able to study unhindered as you do and to be able to expand your abilities as you wish. In Japanese, we might call it arigatai. Copper, pay careful attention to the word arigatai. As you know, we use it to express thanks or gratitude. But the root of the word in Japanese means something more like difficult, hard, or impossible. It means this never happens. We are grateful for good fortune specifically because we feel that it rarely happens. Thus, the word arigatai has come to refer to something special or rare enough to be thankful for. So when we say arigato or thank you in Japanese, it becomes an expression of gratitude. If you survey the whole wide world and then on top of that, look back at yourself now, you probably would describe your present state as arigatai, wouldn't you? I'm gonna stop right there. Um, and I'm curious maybe from some of the, the JAST members, um, if this rings true with your understanding of the word arigato or arigatai, or um, if this felt new or different. Or maybe there are native speakers also in this room who might have a thought. Um, I, I can maybe add a little something. Yeah, I mean, it kind of reminds me of another, um, Japanese phrase like um multi nai like you, like especially food how you don't want to waste it and how mm -hmm. precious food is like I was a elementary and junior high school teacher in Japan for a couple of years and I remember during lunchtime like teachers were always on the kids like do not be wasteful like be very thankful that you have this food to eat every day mm. That's a great, yeah, um, juxtaposition of arigatai and motainai, which, yeah, as you're saying, it's, I think, um, Japanese people, whenever they talk about food, um, it always comes with that feeling or that word of arigatai. Yeah. Anyone else have a thought or I can move on to the next one, next excerpt? Um, yeah, I just, that, that one I really like circled because for me it was, even though I speak both languages, I actually never knew about the root of the word arigatai before reading this. Um, so let's see, let's scroll down a little bit more. I'm going to talk now about, um, a part that I think, uh, might answer Heather's question about what might've gotten redacted. And I have a feeling, um, not, I, I don't even think this is like controversial or anything, but maybe just thinking about like the time period. 
um, that this was published in, it could have been seen as something that was probably, yeah, just really um, uniquely global. So um, let's see, what would make sense here? Um, is that it? Okay, so in this portion of the book, um, so, so Copper has been, has been talking with his friends and one of his friends, sisters, uh, she gets really, really riled up and excited over Napoleon. And she says, oh my gosh, Napoleon, he's such a hero. Like we should all be like him. Um, that's an oversimplified version of the chapter that is very nuanced and well written. But anyway, all the boys, you know, come out of this uh, meeting just being really like, ardent champions of Napoleon. And then the uncle hearing about this writes another letter. <laughs> he says, wait, 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 <laughs> let me tell you a little bit more about um, not just about like Napoleon, the triumphant hero, but about like the man who he did change the world, but let's talk about how and why. So um, let's see. Um, oh, I think this is, yes, okay. This is leading up to the Napoleon part. So I wanna start reading from 170, a little bit further up here from, we say, we say that the history of Japan starts with Emperor Jinmu 2,600 years ago, and that the civilization of Egypt began more than 6,000 years ago. And we think of those as terribly old things, but actually there's a history of many tens of thousands of years before that when nothing could be written. And from this moment on, won't the human race probably continue to progress for many tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of years? Consider this tremendous current. So this is coming back to that actual, um, actually that uh, first excerpt that we read about, you know, people being molecules and droplets in a tide. So they're continuing to kind of use that same um, imagery and language. Um, consider this tremendous current flowing so slowly and endlessly. Doesn't 2000 or even 3000 years time come to seem short? And doesn't a single human life seem no longer than the blink of an eye? Copper. Cast your inner eye once over this vast landscape. Look back at the people called great and heroic in the midst of that faraway flow. And what kind of things might you come to see? First, you might notice that the great people and heroes that loomed so large in your eyes until now were ultimately no more than drops of water drifting in that great stream. Next, you truly see that no matter what, those thing, what things those extraordinary people did, they were exceptionally fleeting unless their work was firmly bound to the, to the current of, of the stream. Some among them watching the stream pour the whole of their lives into it, devoting their extraordinary abilities to driving it forward properly. Still others in an effort to further their own individual goals are completely unaware that they are helping the stream to advance. And then there are those in the stream who, however much that may surprise the world with their brilliance are not of the slightest use to the great current. No, there are more than a few who may be called great or heroic, but instead of advancing the flow, they work instead to try to reverse it. And finally, there are times when one hero will do many things, some with the current and others against. In the course of history, many people arise and do many different things. But ultimately, if what they do is not consistent with the flow of that current, all the accomplishments of any one person will finally and fleetingly fall to ruin. So Copper, even such a man as Napoleon can't escape being an example of this. Um, so before we even get to Napoleon, I love this idea that he breaks down like the different kinds of leaders, the different kinds of ways that you can change the world and really continuing with this kind of metaphor of people being molecules or droplets in the tide, um, you know, what it means to try and go with the flow or try to go, you know, um, or to go against the stream or to not be aware of the current at all. And, um, I was actually talking to my husband about this excerpt and, you know, he's also Japanese and he said, yeah, this, this feels like a very Japanese idea, even though um, this author and this, this uncle character, he's also, you know, um, referring to Napoleon and many other historical leaders to come up with this kind of theory. And um, one thing that before, you know, I open it up to the room, just a little bit further down, he kind of explains, um, kind of in detail, like how Napoleon himself fit into this, um, this idea of a droplet in a stream. But um, 
one thing that, you know, she, she really focuses on is that she wasn't just this one man who was, you know, who changed the world just by himself. She gathered scholars and had them set forth new order clearly in laws. And this was the famous Napoleonic Code. And it became a model for the laws of countries all over. And one could perhaps say that this was the greatest of Napoleon's accomplishments. And why does this matter? Well, the next sentence, this may surprise you, but even here in Japan, we owe a lot to this legal code. And he goes on to explain that, you know, during the Meiji Restoration in the 19th century, when Japan was creating a new society um, that wasn't about feudalism and was more about equality of people, they used Napoleon's code, Napoleon's code. Um, and so, you know, this idea throughout, there's an idea throughout this novel when the boys are talking to each other or when um, Copper is talking with his uncle, this idea keeps coming back about um, what one person does, it affects the whole current. So you might not know more than four people, right? But whatever goes on between those four people, they're gonna influence more people and, you know, that's gonna be connected. So Napoleon, you know, maybe didn't mean to change things in Japan per se, but he did. And so the uncle is kind of trying here to explain um, in terms that copper already sort of knows, right? Because of his association with like molecules and um, tides and um, imagery that makes sense for a 15 year old. The uncle's trying to get at this really nuanced idea about how we're all connected and how we can't really escape it. Um, and I, it's, it's just a, I, I, I think it's, it's, yeah, um, Neil Gaiman actually put it well in his foreword. He said, I don't know that a 15-year-old reading this might really get it, <laughs> but it might be something that, um, you know, will kind of linger with them. And uh, I, I agree with that kind of um, statement. I think for me, you know, as uh, um, I, I have two sons who are really young, but I'm thinking when they come of age, I would like for them to read this, but I don't know if they'll really get it the first time either. Like I'm reading this now as a grown up, and I feel like I'm starting to kind of put together ideas about, oh, this is what um, Japanese history is about, or this is, you know, putting it in, everything into context. But um, anyway, uh, that, was, that was a little bit of a ramble. Any thoughts or questions about this, this portion that we just looked at about Napoleon or about um, the, the different kinds of leaders? This, Irina, this does seem like really deep thinking for children <laughs> to me. So right? it is hard to believe in a way that this is a children's book. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I think what helps Ginger is that I, I am sharing some of the parts, you know, I mean, I think because we only have an hour to do this, I could have chosen a lot of different ones. I really had to boil it down. There are a lot of other more... Um, like fun, just there are pages and pages just describing a snowball fight <laughs> or um, pages describing how to make tofu. Or I, I feel like because of these um, different, um, the, the variety uh, that the author is giving the readers, um, this is one moment that might veer on the heavy maybe um, and kind of history and politics and all that. But because it's woven in with all of these other kind of like um, more uh, nostalgic or fun or, you know, um, different kind of vignettes. I think that's, that's what's successful about it, perhaps. You can't have 300 pages of just this, but if it's sprinkled through in um, more kind of just storytelling about four friends uh, who are all 15, yeah. So getting back to Heather's question, is this, did you say this is part of what was the thought police a section that the thought police had an objection to this section? Yeah, you know, um, I don't have a clear answer on that. I might have to look into, like, if, if there's any sort of history scholars who looked into exactly which parts were redacted, because those, you know, the one that's published right now is the original. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really show us, and even the translator um, couldn't really pinpoint exactly, but um, I think that my, my guess is that um, the parts that talked about sort of ideas of these other countries and other oh. leaders. I, that, that's my guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. 
Before we wrap up, I just wanted to also share this other really beautiful little portion that um, later on in the book, uh, we get a little glimpse of Copper's mother. And the mother is, um, you know, Copper goes through something, um, something really, you know, emotionally hard. He, um, his, his friends, uh, his, the four friends are trying to fight these bullies with these snowballs and Copper, you know, he wants to, he wants to support his friends, but he, he get he freezes and he can't, and he feels like he's betrayed his friends who all get beaten up and, um, you know, Copper feels so guilty and um, he stays home and he's also sick because they were out in the snow for so long. And the mother, the mother doesn't even, it's, it's clear that the mom and the uncle have also been talking, but the mom doesn't even really like say to Copper, I know what's going on, let me tell you. She just starts to talk um, about something that happened to her. And um, the mother just out of nowhere starts to talk about a moment that she remembers really well, you know, when she was a little girl, when she was climbing up these stairs and then there was an older woman in front of her who was really struggling and she wanted to help but there were never was like a good time and it was always awkward. And so they ended up just kind of walking individually. And, um, you know, the, the mom, um, even after all this time, still thinks about that old woman who she didn't help. And she says here to Copper, the older we get, the bigger the things are, the harder they are to take back. And the more we feel this way compared to when we were children. And, um, you know, but she's talking about this memory and she says, but Junichi, the memory of the stone staircase is not a bad memory for me. What I mean is there have often been times since, that, since then when I felt sorry for something I did and wished that I behaved differently, but it's not as if I never felt truly glad I did something either. These aren't the sorts of things where we stop to think how it will work out for us personally. We act to show the warm and beautiful things we feel in our hearts just as they are. And after that, we might have a brief moment now and then when we think, oh, I'm glad I did that. And when I think about those moments now, they all seem to be thanks to the memories of those stone steps. So I kind of want us to think about um, the, the way she uses the word thanks um, and that passage that we read earlier about the Japanese arigato and arigatai, meaning not just um, a straightforward thank you, but something that is difficult, hard, impossible. Um, it has that weight. And the mother brings it up here. And it, this anecdote is something that really helps Copper kind of come out of a shell and, you know, get back together with his friends. Um, so let's see, I'm looking at the time. I know we're sort of nearing the end. Um, and I just wanted to show kind of, yeah, so it kind of ends on this really beautiful note from the uncle. As long as we are human, we all make mistakes. Um, and let's see, just as an example of like some beautiful writing, um, this is Copper waking up. So this is after his sort of like um, all these experiences, all these letter writings, and he, he makes up with his friends and he wakes up the next morning. So this is the part from page 252. He slid open the shoji door. Shoji is a traditional Japanese door where instead of glass, it's a uh, thin paper. He slid open the shoji door and the weather outside was fine. Splashes of yellow from the daffodils beginning to bloom here and there in the yard were so bright that they made him feel wide awake. Um, and I was thinking there are daffodils blooming right now in Nashville. So it felt really timely. <laughs> and um, this book is just filled with a lot of these. Um, I, I feel like this book is kind of like a, um, I think weaving is a really good way to describe kind of what's going on. It's just weaves a lot of different styles, a lot of different kind of storytelling into one book. So sometimes you're gonna get letters. Sometimes you're just gonna get these boys who are just being boys fighting in a, you know, um, with snowballs. Sometimes you're gonna get um, how to make tofu. Sometimes you're gonna get like a little passage about daffodils and you come away just um, with a panoramic sort of understanding of what was going on for um, people like, Copper and his friends around the 1930s in Tokyo. And um, it's really cool to kind of be able to draw parallels with their own lives and to feel connected with that part of Japan. So 
that's kind of my wrap up of the book. I know I'm sorry to have gone on so long. I wanted to open it up to more questions at the end, but um, in the remaining time that we have, does anybody have any last thoughts or questions they wanted to share? I would just say, you know, the, the time I spent reading this book, I just thought about how relevant, you know, all of these thoughts and concerns about conscience and being a, a decent human being and a good man are so relevant right now. And it's such a shame that not more people, um, <laughs> leaders um, have this as a basis for their actions. Yeah. Any other thoughts, closing thoughts? Do you mind sharing your email address with us? You've mentioned yes. it earlier. Yes, yes. Um, I will type it into the chat. Thank you. Yes, please feel free to save that, um, message me. Um, I can send you the PDF that I made as well as my notes um, of some of my favorite quotes and things like that. And um, yeah, I'd love to continue this conversation if um, you have any other follow-up thoughts or questions about it. And, um, oh, before we conclude though, one, one other note, um, I will continue to host these book club events through Jest and we'll do it throughout the year. We're thinking maybe once every couple months um, just to give people time to read. And now that we've done one book from kind of um, the last century, I'm thinking for the next one, we haven't decided yet, but my thought is that we'll choose something more contemporary within the last few years. And we'll just kind of continue to shake things up. And I'd love for all of us to continue reading Japanese books together and um, keep getting to know each other. So uh, the best way to keep um, up with uh, this, these events is to watch out for the JAST newsletter. So if you just go on the JAST website, um, which I think I can also drop in the chats here, um, there should be a link to sign up for their newsletter. So um, let's see, you should have the JAST website now and um, please subscribe to their newsletter and that's the best way to know about the next one. So I'd love to see you all again, meet you all, get to know you a little bit better. I'm sorry, I just jabbered on and on and on, but um, maybe next time we'll get to talk to each other a little bit more. Um, but thank you so much for being here. This was really fun. And I really hope that you all get a chance to read this at some point. And um, yeah, we'll, 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 keep, we'll keep talking books. So 